is 604. I'm going to call this meeting of, thank you, Nick. <laughs> I'm going to call this meeting of the LSC to order. It's 604. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a roll call. When I call your name, please introduce yourself and your function on the board. Uh, Principal Gibson. Kimberly Gibson, Principal of Harriet Tubman. Nick. Nicholas Hall, teacher rep. Lori. Lori Beats, parent rep. Kirsten. Kirsten Clay, parent rep. Emily. Emily Holberg, teacher rep. Kate. Kate Kaczynski, parent rep. Okay, thank you. Okay, so again, we do have quorum, so we're going to proceed. Uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? I motion to approve the agenda. I second. Okay, it has been motioned and seconded to approve the agenda. Is there any discussion? Kate, is, are you voting or you have a question? Okay. <laughs> okay, is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor of approving the motion to, I'm sorry, approving the minutes, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you everyone. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Um, we'll do these, let's do these one at a time. Um, let's do the December minutes first. Is there a motion for the December minutes? I think I haven't done this, so I motion to approve the December minutes. Is there is that right? People always beat me to it. So. <laughs> Is there a second? I was giving someone a chance, so I'll second. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I'm doing secretary tonight as well, so bear with me while I'm, we had another member show up, so I need to mark the time. Okay, it has been motioned and seconded to approve the December minutes. Is there any discussion? All, I assume those are early votes. All in favor of approving the December minutes, please raise your hand. Okay, looks, uh, any opposed? Okay, Ms. Brooks, I did not see a vote from you. Are you abstaining? Ms. Brooks? Sharice? I'm so sorry. Right now I'm having um, a... some technical issues. <laughs> technical issues. Um... Yes, I'm so sorry, um, but I did, I did, I was, I was raising my hand, I'm sorry. Okay, you are in favor of the motion. Okay, duly noted. Thank you for chiming in. Um, the motion passes unanimously. I will move on to the uh, January minutes. Um, I would like to make a motion that we approve the January minutes with one correction, and that would be to item eight, the bylaws committee discussion. There, there was no update provided because we decided to push it to the February meeting. So I'm suggesting the minutes be, I'm not suggesting, I'm moving that the minutes are approved with that correction. Is there a second? I second. I have that same correction. I'll okay, second the thank motion. you, Nick. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please vote using your icon. Ms. Brooks, feel free to chime in whichever way you would like to vote. 
Any oppose? In favor. Okay, thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, just heard from Sarah. She's having some uh, technical difficulties as well, but she is trying to trying to join us. Okay, um, I'm sorry, excuse me while I let her know. Okay, thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda uh, is under new business and that's principal report. Uh, principal Gibson, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. We will start the principal's report for March 2nd, 2022 with our mission. and our vision. At Tubman School, some of our core values in IB are be respectful, be responsible, be safe, and be IB. We are IB Bulldogs. Ms. Uh, Perillis is not uh, able to give the IB report in her place. Ms. Moore will give the IB report today. Good evening, everyone. The IB report, the IB implementation team met in January to begin rewriting some of the, um, the MYP and the PYP action plan to align with the 2020 IB standards and practices. And these action plans are provided to both the district and to the IBO for evidence our pro of our program implementation. Um, also, four of our MIP teachers, as well as our school counselor, will be attending IB workshops this spring centered around the eighth grade communities project, learning on diversity and inclusion, as well as the new subject guides for language and lit in the MYP. Ms. Gibson also completed the Heads of School PYP workshop in February. PYP and MYP teachers are meeting in March to revise their MYP units and continue their work on the vertical and horizontal, uh, horizontal alignment across the, both programs. Thank you, Ms. Moore. You're welcome. Counselor update, Ms. Heather Beaker. I got to reconnect. I have a connection issue, so I'll be right back. We will come back to her case manager updates, Ms. Rebecca Rosenberg. Hi, I was like, oh, it's a connection issue night. Here I am. Hi, everyone. Um, there's not much updates um, from my end. Um, we are um, looking at um, the school is approved for an additional paraprofessional, so we're in the process of hiring for that position. Um, and that we're, we currently have a paraprofessional, paraprofessional that's out um, due to student teaching. Um, and that position is also being posted. Um, and that we're in the process of hiring a special education teacher. Um, there was no case manager meeting um, in January, um, but we did, we did meet twice, sorry, in February. I wrote this in February, even though now we're in March. So I, in February, we had two meetings. Um, because we didn't have a January meeting. So um, we got some updates from the network. Um, and then um, I meet with the, the clinicians team and the behavioral health team um, meets Friday mornings. Um, and actually this Friday morning, we have um, someone coming to work with us on Branching Minds, which is the um, new like place where we put like intervention stuff on and like have like Star 360 information. So that's an exciting thing that's coming up this week. Um, and those are my case manager updates. So thank you guys. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg. We're gonna go back to Heather for the counselor updates. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for taking over. <laughs> um, so students are continuing to complete their um, ILP learning tasks for the 22 school year. Um, we completed for sixth grade. We did an introduction to Naviance to introduce them to the system because it is a system they use sixth through 12th grade. And for seventh grade, um, we started to explore high school uh, for next year. So we did a high school research and fit with those classes. Um, I've been going into the classrooms to do um, whole classroom lessons. Um, so far, I've done lessons on I statements, how to make a friend, um, identifying emotions and stress. Um, and also completed the, um, I didn't put it on there, but completed the IB training uh, for the community project. So I've been supporting the eighth grade classrooms um, with the community project. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Now we will go to Mr. Hall for the PPLC updates. Um, hi, so these are uh, updates from the PPLC from the last two meetings, so January and February, we just met this past Monday. Um, so we are continuing with our focus on looking at a new math curriculum. So some updates since we last met um, Carlos Borges, who is our network STEM um, ISL, attended both our instructional no instructional leadership team meetings and grade level team meetings um, back in January to present some information on um, various math curriculum that are available to our school. Um, and next week during grade level team meetings, uh, teachers will be looking at um, the top three, um, or I think three or four um, that kind of speak to them. Um, and then based on that, obviously, we need to look at the cost for curriculums. We have reached out to the network for that um, or are in the process of reaching out. And then obviously, um, the cost that would be not just the materials, but all the professional development that would those new curriculum would entail. And then obviously budget implications for the next school year. Um, we have also started looking at our SEL curriculum, um, kind of looking at what we currently have. So the two big ones we use are Second Step and Responsive Classroom, and just kind of um, getting um, data from um, our staff on just kind of how we can standardize that. So everyone uses it, but in different ways, depending on grade levels. So we kind of want to standardize that across grade levels. And then um, also looking into other options, because obviously those are not the only two SEL curriculum available. Um, and we will be uh, reaching out to our BHT, so BH team <laughs> um, on that as well. And um, our next meeting will be Monday, March 28th. So we always try to have it right before the, the LSE meeting. Uh, so that is our PPLC updates. Thank you so much, Mr. Hall. And now AP Moore will go over our Renaissance STAR 360 data. As we know, STAR 360, that is the universal screener that Tubman has adopted for this school year. And this assessment is administered three times per year. And if we take a look, this is a computer adaptive test and it was administered DOI in, back in September through October. And we just completed the MOI session. And it's, it is administered for grades three through eight. And the teachers use this data to help determine the instructional level for the students. And I'm just gonna go over some of the data from the beginning of the year assessment to the MOI so that we can see how our school is doing as a whole. And um, before I go over the data, there is a parent report that goes home it shows how each student performed on the assessment as well as give a breakdown of the instructional level for the students. Those reports will be going home on Friday with the progress reports. So we take a look at our data with the STAR 360 to be at benchmark. That's the 40th percentile. We do know that in WEA benchmark was the 50th percentile. As I was doing my research with the Lincoln studies and the comparative analysis, there's no reason as to why STAR 360 have it at the 40th percentile other than this is something that CPS has set to be at benchmark. So the blue represents the beginning of the year data and the burgundy represents the MOI data. So if we take a look and read it, for MOI, we were at 58.6% 
overall as a school. And then for BO, for MOY, we were at 60.3%. In mathematics, we're at 56% for BOY. And then for MOY, it was 63%. And we have a school-wide target. We're looking to get um, at 70% in both reading and mathematics by the end of the year. For STAR 360, this is a breakdown per grade level. Give you a chance to look at this uh, slide. The purple represents the BOY and the uh, blue is the MOY. AP Moore, just, just to clarify to those who are listening, um, BOY is beginning of year, correct? And MOY is middle of year? Yes, that is correct. I do apologize for not breaking that down. And then this is the mathematics data. Again, the red represents the beginning of the year and the black is the middle of the year for grades three through eight. And then we have our target of 70%. Can I ask a question? Yes. So it seems like there's a lot of variability just year to year. Um, there's no necessarily de definite trend um, as the kids get older or anything. There's just certain years that seem like they're struggling a little bit more to get to those target um, levels. So are you guys um, working on any specific in interventions for the grade levels that seem to be farther away from target? Because um, it seems like some grade levels are right where we want them to be and then others have a long way to go. To yes. Um, do you want to address this one for this one? Okay. If we take a look uh, at the data, you're correct. It is it's showing very levels. What this classroom teachers are doing in each of the great bands, we have intervention blocks built within the classroom schedule. There are uh, certain skills that are being targeted based on the STAR 360 has what is called the CDM and custom which is an intervention program that's built within STAR 360 that the teachers are able to use to target those particular skills to get the students to move to the next level, as well as uh, school-wide, we're implementing um, Wellness Wednesday that is incorporating some of these interventions as well. And grade level team meetings have uh, special focuses on these particular skills. Did you want to add anything? Yes, sir. So after looking at this data, that's going to lead us into our CIWP buckets of work, which Principal Gibson would elaborate more on. So in our CIWP buckets of work, we have four areas of concentration. Social emotional learning, multi-tier systems of support, student voice and engagement, and curriculum. During tonight's meeting, we wanted to share that given the pandemic and our district-wide focus has been on student engagement for the 21 school year, it makes sense for all schools to take a pause and regroup. So instead of developing a new CIWP, all schools have been granted by the state and also by our CPS district a third year with their CIWP. Tubman's heart team and also our instructional leadership team have met over the last since February and March to review our areas of our CIWP and update the progress. CIWP implementation and timeline. The CIWP is a 24 page actionable uh, item document. For the sake of this meeting, we concentrated on things that are beginning to be in prog progress and things that have not yet started to share our intentions. The first area that we will continue to concentrate on is social and emotional learning. Our action item, continuum of SEL supports, such as you heard about the responsive classroom, modeling reflection, restoration, 
and steps needed for school-wide consistency and equity of application will be explored, created, and implemented. That was in progress of winter, that should say 2021 and spring of 2022 and the PD. And we are continuing to work on that. We will have SEL PD at the beginning of the implementation of our SEL curriculum school-wide starting next school year. And it will continue on. We will give our teachers time to take the professional development and implement it in the middle of the year. And we anticipate completion for this action item by spring 2023. The next item, conduct informational and interactive parent meetings to provide school level information on both school wide and classroom restorative practice. That's in progress because we're talking about our restorative practice and we're trying to get new training for our new teachers. But starting the parent meetings to specifically focus on the restorative practice, we will start that in the fall for the beginning of the year. The next item, create a menu describing school-wide restorative practice utilized broken down by intervention tiers. As you will know, it is not yet started. Currently at Tubman, we do not have a restorative practice coordinator. That was a position that was here last year. We did not have that this year when we became administrators. We are looking forward to uh, hiring uh, a restorative justice coordinator, ensuring that they receive training and ensuring they train the staff on restorative practices. Next one, create restorative practice handbook for staff and families. As stated before, it has not been started because we don't have a restorative practice coordinator as of yet. We are hoping with the budget and reviewing the budget to make it aligned with our CIWP priorities to hire a restorative practice coordinator if the budget allows and we are hoping that this handbook will be completed by spring of 2023. Next, research opportunities for staff professional development on trauma-sensitive approaches, development to determine timeline and feasibility. That's in progress. There was a partnership uh, created prior uh, to us with Lori Hospital. It was paused because of the pandemic. We don't know if that's still available, but we are going to reach out to the district to still get that trauma-informed professional development for staff. Make SEL systems visible and transparent in the building in order to enhance students' understanding of approaches. That's in progress, and it also will begin in fall 2022 after teachers receive the professional development. The S. The self-assessment of MTSS implementation, SAM, will be completed by the MTSS and or ILT quarterly. The results will be used to guide meaningful conversation with and promote common understanding among staff. We are, have not started that yet, and we are anticipating it starting fall 2022. Our next strategy to focus, again, is MTSS. We are sharing items that I have not yet started or are just beginning to be in process. Provide opportunities for interventionists to collaborate with the classroom teacher on student need and progress. Our current schedule does not allow time for the interventionists to collaborate with the teachers. Their schedules do not match. We are exploring structures for after school collaboration time and paying teachers possible extended pay. Create school-wide tool to monitor intervention cycles. This is not yet started. As you know, you might have heard our case manager share that we are getting training this Friday on branching minds. CPS is rolling out branching minds. It's supposed to align to the STAR 360 data. So we are hoping to create a, um, intervention cycles and tools after receiving the training and start this for fall 2022. Implement school-wide tool, document progression through tiers of support and outline the potential interventions and timeline. Again, that will begin fall 2022 after either branching minds is fully 
administered across the district or if we come up with our own intervention tools. We don't wanna to have too many systems for staff to use. Advisory with staff to look at Aspen weekly in sixth through eighth grade to create student-based goals, contracts, and reach out to counselors to achieve those on tracks or incentives. That is not yet started. We are be starting discussion with staff on implementation of this and hoping to start this for next fall. Analyze end of year data for subgroup specific performance, identifying potential root causes and priority groups for moving forward. So as you guys know, over the last two years, we have not had any data yet. So that's why this could not be started due to COVID. We are planning to start at the end of this school year because we will have data based off the STAR 360 data to use. Strategy three, students voice and engagement. Identify and implement classroom-based opportunities for increasing student voice, choice, and ownership across grade events. That's something that's in progress and we're gonna continue it and assess it. Expand opportunities for IB classroom ambassadors to share their learning with the community through school videos and testimonies. It is not yet started. We are beginning it um, the middle of the year, winter 2020. 2022, I'm sorry. Maintain and continue peer counseling program. That is not yet started. Uh, Ms. Michelle McNally shared that she would support that program. It's similar to peer jewelry. We haven't started it this year due to COVID. We are attempting to start it for the fall. Utilize student council and IB ambassadors to create diversity awareness activities and school-wide initiatives celebrating and educating peers on issues related to diversity, social awareness, and becoming community activists. That's in progress and we're gonna continue it in the fall. We don't have specifically, if you notice it says in progress and begin in fall, we don't have necessarily the ambassadors yet, but we do have our student council doing this. Uh, currently right now, they're doing it for Women in History Month. Review school vision and mission and graduate statements. That's in progress and we're gonna continue that um, discussion in the fall. With COVID happening, we want to look at our school's mission and vision to see if it needs to be updated or changed. It's also part of IB to look at your student, uh, your school-wide vision and mission yearly. Number four, curriculum. As you heard during our PPLC, uh, we have not yet selected a math curriculum. Most of the things around the curriculum initiative are with our math curriculum. So you will see explore, write, and teach IB math units of inquiry will focus on problem solving, investigating, and critical thinking. It is not yet started because at the end of this year, we will be selecting and finalizing a new math curriculum for PYP. We will be beginning to develop the new math units for PYP in the fall. Budget review. At the end of January, as of January 31st, 2022, our total amount in internal accounts is $229,161.91. We don't reconcile for February until a week to a week and a half into the month. Student-based budget, non-payroll, we have $77,467.12. Expenditures for January and February since our last meeting. Administration IB workshop, $775. Teacher IB workshops, 1800 teacher training workshops 1250 our supplies totaling $1,086.82 $31.72 are on back order and drama and dance supplies for $172.96 principal competencies continuous improvement for staff and students since our last meeting in February and 
beginning of March, we have conducted reach formal observation cycles with probationary assigned teachers. Reviewed and assessed CIWP with our HART team and our instructional leadership team. Develop action steps as we move forward toward year three. We saw the need based off our students that were transferring in and we requested additional ESP based on our students needs and we were awarded a ESP funded by the district. Powerful professional learning. Plan PD for staff during weekly grade level team meetings. IB trainings for staff and administrators. Attended monthly PLCs for administrators with the fund and network for ISLs and administrators meeting hosted by the CEO. College and career readiness. Arranged for student voice at the unveiling ceremony on February 14th. Attended CPS February board meeting with middle school students as part of the honoring excellence and counselors report on Naviance. Families and communities. Hosted monthly principal conversations and published bi-monthly community blasts host bi-monthly school tours, and deliver principal reports at monthly LSC meetings and monthly FOT meetings. Self-discipline thinking and action. Meeting monthly with CPS new principal for coaches and leadership. Meet weekly with CPS mentor principal to continue developing leadership skills and engage in reflective practice to develop actionable steps for continuous improvement. What's to come? We will continue to work with staff to select school-wide SEL curriculum. We will continue discussion on selecting a math curriculum for PYP during PPLC meetings and GLTs. Continue work on our CIWP priorities. Hire additional SPED teacher and ESP with assistance from the Tubman Hiring Committee. Those are members who work in that department where the employee will be working. PYP and NYP teachers are meeting in March, as you heard, to revise NYP units and continue our work on vertical and horizontal alignment across our programs. Differentiated and small group instruction PD for staff and ongoing communication and partnerships with families. We would like to shout out uh, our families. We have had multiple parents who just uh, completed the volunteer process with CPS, so we will be leaning in on you. And in closing, we want to take a look back at the first two quarters to see what we have accomplished together. Back to School Bash sponsored by Friends of Tubman. Tubman's first day of school. Outdoor lunch, based off parents' feedback, as well as staff. Interim CEO visits. Fall festival. Tubman Student Council Food Drive. Holidays around the world. Visit on December 9th from Harlem Globetrotters. Tubman on the Move Dance Show.
Tubman Marquee unveiling. Our second dance show photos. Our new sign. FOT I Heart Tubman Fundraiser. Questions and discussion. Thank you, Principal Gibson and AP Moore and all the other presenters. Thank you for the information and the update. Uh, we'll open the floor to council members for questions. Uh, Lori, I see you have, have your hand raised. Uh, I took a lot of notes and I, I tried to do it quickly, but number one, Emily's baby. We all got really excited when we saw that baby. We need more of that. Um, so I have a few questions. One from Ms. Rosenberg as case manager. Um, I, I saw that and I'd heard that we are missing um, a special ed teacher. How are minutes being met without that position? Because I believe it covered a few classrooms. Are there subs in place or how is that being handled during the hiring process? Sorry to put you on the spot, Ms. Rosenberg. I'll come back to that one. Oh, no, there she is. Hi. No, I'm I'm here. I just wasn't sure if I was to answer that or if Ms. Gibson was going to answer that question. I can answer it. We currently have a sub in place. Oh, cool. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Let's move on. Uh, this was also in the comments, but it's also, I have the same one. I know we've talked before. The presentations are blurry, and I know it's an internet thing at the school, especially when you're both in the same room, is it possible to send out the CIWP and the things that you presented so that families and LSC members can see it clearly? Because I'm sure there was a lot of good information, but some of it was hard to read. Yeah, that was easy. I saw that comment at the end. We can talk as a council and maybe we can share it and have Tina present it since she's not on school grounds because I think it's an internet issue here. Yeah, it's a little hard and it's, and it's frustrating because you've clearly taken so much time to put together a really helpful presentation, but then it gets frustrating because we can't see it. And even the cute pictures are blurry and we all wanna pick out our kids in the pictures. Um, when it comes to uh, the student council and IB ambassadors, I just wanna throw out, I, I'm on the um, equity committee, the communications committee and the Tubman Inclusive Education Supporters Committee. And we would love to work with the kids and the students to have their voice represented. So if there's ever an opportunity, I mean, it clearly, like, especially when you're talking about them working with like Women's History Month or whatever, and there's things that we're talking about in Tubman Inclusive Education Supporters, where we would love student voices to help share that message. So I'm throwing it out there because I'm on all three committees that I would happily work with the kids um, on any of those things. Uh, Mr. Hall, and you were talking, and I, this may not be you to answer, but when we're talking about a lot of what also what I'm going to do in my updates later on, when we're talking about restorative classrooms, second step, how are we using the CPS Office of Social Emotional, um, what is it, Social Emotional Learning Health, uh, especially because we don't have that position, but there are, we do have for our network, we have a, a person that we can be using. Are we using those free services while we're looking at some of these other services? Uh, great question, Lori. Yes, we are. Um, I know um, our, well, Rebecca, our case manager is on our PVLC, um, so I know she's always in close contact with, I believe it's Veronica, right? Principal Gibson is our network person. Um, so yeah, so Absolutely. we are using her as a, as a resource, just like we're using Carlos for um, STEM and math curriculum. So yeah, we are awesome. making sure to reach out. Um, and I just want to throw that out there that this is something that we've talked about quite a bit on other committees and as much help that we can bring in um, to help the staff, but to help the families and the students as much as possible would be great. Along those lines, when we're talking about the budget, um, you had said, and I remember when that position was eliminated before you came in and I was not happy about it then. 
And then you said, but you did say, if it allows, if we can just throw in there that this is a position that um, I know many people would feel very, very valuable. So just let, let you know, like as a parent voice and a parent rep that having a restorative coordinator for our school is so important, especially with the work we're doing around the renaming and equity and all of the things that we have, um, if we can really make sure. Also along the line for budget, I'm seeing that we had money for art supplies and dance and things like that. I would like to throw it out there when you're um, evaluating the budget and looking at how to spend some of our funds that we could use um, budget for the library, which again, I'm gonna talk about during my uh, community updates, but also sensory supports. I know that teachers are spending their own money on fidget items and sensory and special chairs and all the things that the kids need to be emotionally regulated and successful. If we can ever talk about how would we request funds for that from our budget, that would be excellent. That was just rhetorical. Next up, right to play. Um, earlier this year, we talked about the right to play act that passed that up through fifth grade, there should be two recesses a day. And I don't believe that is happening in our younger grades yet. So when will we start to implement uh, two recesses per That's day? That's not law, it's not to start the next school year, Lori. Okay. That's the part next school year. All right, it was suggested. So many schools have already started it. So we are, so you're saying we will not be having that until next school year. Sad. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there, I know that this happened and we, we missed a few LSC meetings, but for the next set of um, inclement weather, could we set a school-wide policy that we will be outside for recess if the temperature is above this or not? Because it seems that this year, um, and I'm sorry, I do know you talked about it at a principal meeting, but we missed two LSC meetings. Uh, is there a temperature policy that children will still have outdoor recess um, as long as we reach a certain temperature or how does that work? So it's two things. There is a certain policy uh, of 32 degrees or above they're outside, but also unless it's a safety hazard. So there has been times when it was a safety hazard as I shared at the last council meeting and it had to do with snow removal and ice. I think so, that was at one of the parent conversations, the principal parent one, and I'm sorry I missed that one. So, but I also shared it at the council, no problem. Okay. Um, um, but, but if we could just set that, and I, I'm just going to throw out, maybe we could talk about that at another time because many schools have a lower threshold. Um, you know, it's like 26. I didn't, fi I didn't finish. So, anything, I didn't finish. You started I'm talking. I'm sorry. So, 32 or above, we do go outside. That is the CPS policy. Anything between 15 and 32 is principal discretion and again safety so i always pull in our engineer and we do a walk of the building the outside perimeters and see if it's any safety things but i'm all for supporting students as outside as much as possible unless it's a really bad snowstorm a safety risk or it's pouring down raining then we'll be outside i'm even looking for as the weather is warming up possible having lunch back outside that was my next question. Um, could we, uh, I, I know that um, a lot of people really enjoyed outdoor time and the outdoor lunches, especially we don't have a lunchroom and that break. So that was my other question. Um, almost done. Uh, the war in Ukraine, I was wondering, I'm, I'm assuming that in a city like Chicago, we may have Ukrainian families in our school. Is there a way that we're supporting um, students? And plus it's just a really difficult time in the world. Is there a way that if we do know if we have Ukrainian families that we can do something as a community to show support um, for the war that's happening? Thank you, Lori. Um, anyone else have any uh, comments, questions regarding the report? Sarah? Uh, you're on mute, Sarah. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Sarah, can you type it in the chat, maybe? Your question, if we can't hear you. Hmm. Okay, I think you said you'll drop it in the chat. <laughs> I think I'm trying to read your, oh, your microphone popped up for a second. Mm -mm, can't hear you.
Uh, please, please share um, via the chat, um, Sarah, any questions and, and we'll come back to you. Um, anyone else, questions, comments? Um, one thing that I wanted to learn more about is um, the SEL curriculum. Um, I know you're in the process of, of figuring that out, of choosing. What what exactly is that curriculum used for and how will it tie into restorative practice if it does? Okay, so SEL second step is social emotional learning. As you know, social emotional learning impacts academic learning as well. Uh, we don't have restorative practice across all grade levels. We have it in some grade levels, so, and we have second step in some grade levels. The district is updating for middle school second step and making it digital. It just won't be ready till the fall. So teachers are using a combination of things, but right now for the spring and as we look toward next year, we're trying to come up with something that we use across school-wide. And if we have a restorative justice coordinator, as Lori shared about how important that is, that person can go to the district-wide training and help train the staff at the beginning of the year, staff PD. That way, all of us create alignment of the restorative practice and the SEL used across the school. And the students can engage in making posters so everybody understands what practices and actions should look like in a classroom, in a hallway, in an auditorium. Okay. With, and we plan to share that out with the parents as well once we finalize it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, with um, with the inherited lack of a position for that the restorative um, practice coordinator or whatever the position is called, um, are there? And I and I understand there's there's a lot of work and training that needs to happen. Just wondering if there are any stop gaps we can take advantage of in the interim um, to, yeah, I don't, I don't know the, the lingo well enough, but to, to, to make sure or, or, or at least try to, um, try, try to make sure that we're, we're following up with our families in that way, you know, some in ways that are consistent with uh, restorative practice, even though we don't have a coordinator. So sure, we're following up with families because, you know, depending on what's going on at the school, we can't share any students specific thing, but students are engaging in restorative uh, conversations and they also are doing reflection. So that's happening in classrooms. We just want to create more cohesiveness across the building. And really having that coordinator will help us align that so everybody's practicing the same thing. Without all the staff members having the correct PD and training, it makes it difficult for us right now. We are looking for ways to right now get our new teachers, if it's possible, between quarter three, the remainder of quarter three and quarter four, if we can get um, those staff members trained, and then a retraining for all staff members at the, in fall prior to school being started so we all can be on the same page. Thank you, Principal Gibson. Um, I see, Sarah, I see your question in the chat. Are you able to come off mute now or? Oh, oh, dang it. Nope, that didn't work. So. <laughs> uh, Principal Gibson, uh, I'll just read um, Sarah's question. Um, <clears throat> it says, thank you for sharing more about the STAR 360 data. This is one data a point of many on how our students are doing. Can you please talk more about the ways in which how we are monitoring subgroup performance, attendance, and disciplinary data year round? I'll just stop there and then there's another question um, after that. So can you please talk more about the ways in which we, the ways how we are monitoring subgroup performance, attendance, and disciplinary data year round? So to look at the subgroup performance, we desegregate the data, and that's how we're able to see it and talk about it when we're doing data analysis, doing our grade level team meetings, and come up with interventions and share knowledge and collaboration amongst the grade level team. 
As far as attendance, we do have an attendance team. Attendance has been really hard this year due to COVID. We've had multiple flips as you guys get the communication uh, from the school every time we have a flip. So attendance has been an issue, but that's not just for Tubman. This is across the district and it's also across the world right now as we're trying to emerge from a pandemic. But attendance is something we're watching carefully. We're trying to promote it. Uh, we give out, uh, we have a raffle for perfect attendance, but we paused it just for now because we saw after the winter holidays, there were a lot of flips and we didn't want kids to feel bad if they got COVID and they had to stay home and they weren't entered. So far, social emotional, we paused far as giving out uh, school-wide incentives for attendance. And then far as disciplinary, we are monitoring and reviewing that data currently. So we're in the process of doing that and we will be working with our hard team far as looking at discipline uh, data for the school as a whole. And we've also met this week with our network, ISIL Veronica, who is the SEL lead. So we're talking about making sure that we have training and supports for our teachers and supports that our students need. Okay, there was a second uh, question. And Sarah, if you have any follow-up, please go ahead and just type it in the chat. Um, the question is, how is this information being used and shared? And what is the frequency of sharing this data? So far as, I don't know which data she's talking about. I know STAR 360, Ms. Moore went over in her report. That's only implemented beginning of year, middle of year, and end of year. We shared it out with parents at the beginning of the year. And the report we just gave during the principal report, uh, it was mentioned that the middle of the year, STAR 360 data will be sent home to parents on Friday with report card pickup. We also, teachers do formative assessments in our room, so we have multiple data. So I'm not quite sure if that answered your question, Sarah. Sarah, are you talking about the monitoring data, how that data will be? Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, just to go back to the other one you had, Sarah, with the with the um, data as far as um, how often it's shared out, are you talking about the STARS 360 or the monitoring you were talking about? Of the STARS 360? Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, it looks like there's a lot that has yet to be implemented as it relates to the CIWP. It looks like a lot of things are kicking off in the fall. Are there ways you are looking uh, to implement these initiatives earlier or later? I, I know, Sarah, you relate to the meeting, so you might not have heard prior to my report. In this report, there's 24 pages of CIWP. There's a lot of completed items. We just shared things that we are just in the beginning of process or things that have not yet started. So that only was five pages of it. So there's many things that have completed. Some of the things couldn't be started because it was COVID. That's why the district and the state decided to extend and give another year for schools to really concentrate and focus on those items that they haven't started. And then with the restorative practice items, we would need a restorative practice coordinator to make the handbook. We just can't make a restorative practice handbook without having a coordinator who's been trained to create that document for families and for our staff. So those are the reasons um, why. And we will continue this conversation uh, with just specifically LSC members. And we'll be sharing out the complete document that we worked on with the ILT and HAR team with the LSC. Okay, I think, um... I think your question addressed the, the rest of this, but um, if not, Sarah, um, let me know. I'm just gonna go ahead and read it. Uh, given the issues the pandemic has highlighted, SEL and the implementation of MTSS would be something that should be in full implementation. However, we yet to fully implement this work. Can you consider aligning implementation to current needs of the school and beyond? Uh, did you have anything to add to that, Principal Gibson? 
I did. So I just met with the network chief a week ago, and that is our focus for quarter three and focus four specifically on two targeted goals for the remainder of the year, which is MTSS and SEL. And we'll be incorporating the voices of staff, parents, as well as students. Some of these things that's on here on the CIWP that we share, they just haven't been started yet because it involves multiple people and also outside support. But we are implementing some of those things. And that's why we're calling it out and letting you know what we will be working on for the remainder of quarter three and four and going into when it will fully be implemented in the fall. Thank you, Principal Gibson. Um, Kate and then um, Lori. I was just going to follow up on what I think Sarah was asking with about the 360 question. Sorry if I'm wrong, Sarah, but just that um, we understand that there the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year data. But when you're in the middle of the year and you see that certain subgroups or certain groups of kids are not making the gains that they should be, what are we doing to kind of do a more um, like micro assessment between now and end of year to make sure whatever interventions that you guys are doing are actually causing the kids to have those gains so that we don't just get to the end of the year and say, oh, what well, we, those interventions we did weren't successful or were successful. So I think she was asking about, yes, we know 360 is only three times a year, but what are we doing particularly for those kids that aren't making gains to make sure between now, the, the, the la now and the last endpoint that we actually are successfully intervening? And by we, I'm not doing anything. So <laughs> sorry, all the wonderful teachers. So, sorry. Thanks for clarifying that question. So maybe I misunderstood the question. So some of the things we're doing, I don't know if you heard me say, we're meeting with a network specialist that's training us on branching minds. It's linked, it's an intervention tool, and it's linked to the 360 data. Our first training is this Friday. We're sending out communication so parents are aware of where their student falls in a continuum. And then teachers will be meeting as needed with families, as well as we'll be discussing the data in teams to come up with those interventions after we have the Friday uh, Branching Minds training. Oh, and Ms. Moore wants to add something. Also uh, built within the STAR 360 uh, screener, we have the intervention uh, programs within there as well. It's called the CBM and custom. and custom. And those particular interventions are linked to the skills that those students tested on. And teachers are implementing these interventions either, uh, I believe it's twice per week, and they're getting real-time data, and they're adjust, uh, adjusting their instruction based on the data from the intervention program of the custom in CDM. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Thank you. Lori? I think no, you're on me, darling. We can't hear you. Hold on. There we go. I was also kind of feeling like I might be speaking for Sarah a little. It's hard um, because while I understand the concept of we're pushing everything out another year for CIWP because of COVID, I think that some of us sometimes feel like we already are two years behind. We're really excited to keep moving. And so thank you for clarifying, uh, Principal Gibson, that there's 25 pages of things that already have been done. But I was in the meeting the whole time and I heard that thing and I'm like, oh, I don't want to wait another year. So speaking of not wanting to wait another year, is there a possibility that we can make a say, OK, we realize that it is incredibly important to have a restorative uh, practices person and we have money in our accounts. Is it possible to ever say that this position is extremely valuable and we would like to start that process of hiring sooner rather than later? Is that allowed if we voted on it? I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that problem, uh, you know, that question up. There's a couple layers. Staff is decided from year to year. The budget was set prior to me coming, so I inherited this budget. So I can't switch any money around for that. One of the reasons we haven't touched the money that's in our internal account, as you know, CPS did not tell us yet if we're going to be held accountable for our 20 day. So our first focus is to save all of our staff members who we currently have working, save all of their positions. So if we're in jeopardy and we need to cut a position, we have a little cushion 
to cover that position and continue to keep smaller class sizes instead of maxing them out to 35 and 38. And then when we get whatever the amount is in the new budget, that's one of our next priorities after we ensure we save everybody's position is the restorative um, justice coordinator, if that makes sense to you guys. That totally makes sense. And then I'm just going to ask, is this money safe? Because some of you may not remember, um, but I'm sure you do. Uh, a few years ago, CPS went in and to kind of uh, fix some of their budget shortfalls, they took every school that had certain money saved, they took that those funds. And so certain schools were spending everything down quickly. So this money is safe. CPS cannot come in and say, hey, we messed up. We're going to take these to help fulfill other obligations. So our money is safe. Correct. This current money, I don't know if you know as well. This is FOT funds from last year that we have kept in, in this internal account strategically. What we haven't done is moved any fundraising money from this year from FOT. I haven't requested the money be given to the school as of yet. We're trying to wait on that. But this money that's in the internal account is our safety net yet. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay, thanks again, uh, Principal Gibson, Principal Moore, and all those who contribute to the principal report. And thank you, council members, for your engagement and for your important questions on getting some additional information. Okay, the next item on the agenda is uh, fundraising and FOT. I believe Patty is still here. And so um, there are, uh, there's a fundraiser to, um, that the board has been provided with that uh, we're, FOT is seeking approval to and there for, and there'll also be an FOT update. Uh, Patty, it's up to you which one you'd like to do first. Hi there, welcome. Um, I guess I could just do the, well, did you want me to read the report that I sent to the council of the accomplishments of FOT this year or? Uh, you know, I tell you, I think uh, I think it's worth our entire community hearing it. You guys have done some unbelievable work in supporting the school. So, yeah, I think you should highlight it all. Absolutely. All right. Here I go. Um, okay. Fun run. And so first, um, the notes of celebration that I sent to the council were the fundraisers. Um, the fun run fundraiser on October 8th, that raised just under $60,000. Um, the Muskie Fest uh, new fundraiser that we did this year raised $3,500. Um, the dining nights out combined, so Panera, Lou Malnati's, McDonald's, Easy Street, I don't have the numbers for this week's yet, but uh, we've raised just over $1,000 on the dining nights out. Uh, the minted smaller fundraiser, but raised $374. The Building Blocks Holiday Give Back raised the $25 store gift card to be used for an incentive. And our most recent iHeart Tubman Pledge Drive fundraiser raised just over $22,000. And it looks like the entire school did um, receive their incentive prizes. So um, let's see, pre-K through third all received glow in the dark parties, which I was able to attend and enjoyed. Um, we also, the fourth through sixth grade will all be earning their incentive of playing an hour's worth of games like Cahoots, Jack in the Box or Jackbox, I don't know what it's called, with their teachers. And then on Friday, we will, FOT will be sponsoring the seventh and eighth grade pizza parties. Um, we were able to give out free water bottles to all students. And we had over 60 students, 65 students that got to spin our prize wheel daily throughout the entire um, three week fundraiser. So each day, students who had filled out their I Heart Tubman because hearts, they were selected randomly uh, by draw and they were called down um, to the office to spin the prize wheel and got to take home the prize immediately from that prize wheel. And that was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed that. Hey, um, Patty. Hey, Patty. There was, there was one. Um... That fundraiser that you didn't that the spirit wear you didn't oh, get you're that right out. i'm sorry you're right the spirit wear one um raised fifteen hundred dollars and we are about to start uh another one in march so yes that was good lori um 
in terms of community building events, which are not fundraisers, we did the back to school event as Principal Gibson showed on the slide uh, at the beginning. We had a large turnout of Tubman families and staff, which was a free event for um, everyone. The fall Hocus Pocus event, which also had an excellent turnout of Tubman families and community members. We believe it was likely over 200, also completely free. Uh, we had many donations from both the community and Tubman families, along with a large volunteer group. Um, the fall meet and greet happy hour that we sponsored at Wills uh, for staff and parent caregivers to attend an evening night out together. We had about 40 to 50 total attendees and staff had 90 minutes together with a free drink and appetizer to enjoy just as a staff and then um, parents or caregivers and or caregivers could attend after that. We also sponsored the Subway Lunch for Staff on Report Card Pickup Day, which we will be doing again in April. And then in December, we had the, since we didn't really, weren't able to do an indoor winter, to land, winter, winter land, um, we were able to do a hug in the mug coat swap event, which was, we had three Tubman mugs that we were handing out to anyone that attended and they received hot chocolate in the mug. And then we also had a coat swap where um, people brought not just coats, there was a lot of generous uh, donations there of just winter outerwear. And we had a lot of families take things that they could use, which was great. Um, the assistance program fund got, had some uh, assistance provided this year. We donated a total of $1,700 to five families in need so far. Um, our big one was the Tubman marquee sign, which we were super excited to Split the cost with Senator Feigenholz and Tom Twenty, Alderman Tom Twenty, and then finally, uh, just recently this week, we finally did get a chance to um, give these out. We tried to get these sooner, but because of you know the pandemic, this was very hard to get. But we did get the KN95 masks for staff and students, um, ten each, and so we purchased that for um, thir roughly thirty-seven hundred dollars. And then upcoming events, we have the continued spirit wear, which we're hoping to add some promotional products to that as well. Uh, we have continued monthly dining nights out. The Portillo's one, which was the other day, I don't have the numbers yet. We have um, a sip and dip interesting one coming up, which we're going to be promoting soon. Chipotle in April and Diagostino's in May. We kind of trying to spread them out in different neighborhoods because we were unable to find restaurants that had multiple locations that were willing to do fundraisers on the same night. So instead we're just kind of branching out to different neighborhoods and it's been it's been going well, I think, from the feedback we're hearing. Um, report card pickup day, we will sponsor that lunch again. And then also teacher appreciation week, which is coming up the week of May 2nd. We have some events and a committee that's working on that. And then finally, we're, we are hoping that the um, gala and sort of like an in-person auction at the gala gets approved at tonight's fundraiser. I mean, sorry, at tonight's LSC. And that's it. That's a lot of talking, sorry. <laughs> it's my first chance tonight to use the, the pom-poms. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> Yeah, great job, great you job. You really do. And if, if you've never been to a school that doesn't have such an amazing FOT, they make such a huge difference. And it's a lot of work. And the way they, uh, the way you, Patty, and, and your team, and all the volunteers, how hard you work to spread those events out and you there's something for every you know like if you can't afford it there's no pressure and if this one works out this isn't more in your budget i had portillos it was delicious um it's really appreciated how hard you work and how much you try to include um everybody um that's awesome thank you thank you for saying that we have a great team uh, the board that i work with i'm just really grateful to work with everyone on that board because everyone has something amazing to bring to the table and to add and suggest and uh, we're it's we're just really lucky to have that, so I'm grateful for that. Thank you so, so much. So I guess oh, um, no. the the last thing really would be then to just go over the um, the fundraiser request for the gala and live auction. Mm -hmm. And so the council did receive um, the fundraiser ahead of the meeting. Um, so before we have discussion, of course, I'm going to ask if there is a motion regarding the gala and live auction fundraiser. I motion to approve the gala and fundraiser um, as proposed by FOT 
I think Kate is about to say. I second. I second. Oh, okay. Okay, is there any discussion? I have one thing. Um, I'm on equity. <laughs> and so the one thing that I notice is something that I've noticed at other schools is when you say things that you can auction off um, principal for a day and some of those experiences, it sets it up. There's only a certain economic demographic that's ever going to be principal of the day or at other schools it was, you get to lead the walkathon and it's clearly a certain financial demographic who gets to do those types of things. So if we can be aware of those kind of, um, it's not equitable. And then the same thing when the teacher experiences, is there any way we can just, I know I'm just throwing it out there that maybe um, FOT could think about how can we include the kids who are really would love to do this special thing with their teacher, but their family can't afford $50 or $100 or whatever it turns out to be. So if we could just think about that from an equity standpoint, that would be beautiful. But I love, I'm of course gonna approve the fundraiser. Yes, Sarah. you know, I, I completely understand that. And uh, it's been something that we have discussed um, at all of our meetings and kind of why I also included sort of our notes of celebration to, to that, you know, we are very, kind of aware and cognizant of, of that issue. And we really do try to think about making it as equitable as we can. And there are some times that like, we have to revert back to our mission statement of why do we exist? What is Friends of Tubman? Why are we here? And the reason we're here is to raise funds for the school. And sometimes it does require us to hold fundraisers and activities and events that are not just going to be equitable, unfortunately. We, we try our best and we try to do many things throughout the year that are free. And, um, you know, even the wording that we have been using with our fundraisers, we're really cautious this the last couple of years to, you know, not have anyone feel any pressure to donate, but we definitely are seeing the results of that in, you know, the fundraising. So for example, the pledge drive traditionally has raised, you know, upwards of 50 to $60,000. And in the last couple of years, we didn't get anywhere close to that, you know, and so good or bad, I'm very proud of what we have raised this year, despite the difficulties with the pandemic. But, you know, in the conversation that we had as a board, when we were discussing the gala, because this did come up, and I know, you know, the price of the ticket is going to be difficult for, for some of our families, and we want to try to think about that. But on the other side of that, we also do still want to be able to, to have this event. And there's, it's, it's a fine line. So we will definitely remain, you know, on top of that and think about these things when we're we're planning these events. But we also do have to stay true to our mission. And the mission is we got to raise money for the school. And sometimes that requires doing difficult things that are not always seen as equitable, unfortunately. But, you know, you know, for like the prize wheel, for example, we had many amazing things on that prize wheel for all grade levels so that, you know, the kids, all they had to do was just fill out that heart. And so, you know, then have the incentives in the classrooms and stuff like that. We really, we really are trying. So, you know, we'll do the best we can with the community. Sarah. Oh, you're on mute, Sarah. We heard you for a minute there. Okay. Um, she put it in the chat. Okay, thank you, Patty and the FOT for working with neighborhoods that are reflective of the student and family population. Do we know if there are still any district restrictions on fundraising with the pandemic? Earlier, there were caps and limitations. Just want to make sure there are no barriers here that we can get in front of. Yeah, as of right now, and just in terms of my um, connection with other friends of friends groups, um, there are none. And this and this actual event will be held completely outdoors. It's on the roof, uh, the rooftop deck of Lakeshore. Uh, if if you all approve it, that's where it would be. So we would be outdoors, and um, I there haven't been any restrictions that I'm aware of, unless you know, Principal Gibson, if you've heard anything, I don't know, but I, I haven't heard of yeah. any. Just wanted to share there's no restrictions currently at this time. A lot of schools are holding their galas. Kate, you had your hand early, up earlier. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Patty for all the hard work and the board and FOT for everything they've done. And I also just wanted to call out all, I, I completely agree, Lori, trying to make sure that we're looking at everything um, through the lens, making sure that everyone feels welcomed and a part of this community and, that there those equity issues are looked at but I, I having 
worked on FOT for many years and trying to figure out how to raise as much money so that we can have as much and as many resources for our teachers to do the best um, with everything that they have. Um, I think it is a real challenge and trying to strike that balance is really hard. Um, but I think Patty has and the team have done a ton of things trying to always be cognizant of that. And I think they've actually made great gains in the last like four or five years on that. Um, and so I just, but you know, I just running that all those years, the things that you got parents to bid up and that we got the most money for were those things like principal for a day. And so it is really hard when you're figuring how much money you could raise for programs or deciding not to do that. I mean, I think there would be possibly an option of when we do those things, people are paying for two, one that gets raffled off and one for their kids so that there was like something along those lines. You also could do something like those those teacher um, experiences, parents, there could be half of them are bought and then, or asking parents to buy a ticket for another kid and then kids could submit if they wanna do it. And then we pull from the hat from those kids who are interested because not everybody's interested in everything. But you know, for the kid who wants to do like Japan for a day with Miss, um, oh my God, I'm losing my brain. Okay. Um, but <laughs> but you know, like so not every kid wants to do it. But the, the kids who really want to do it, if they like, you know, submitted their name, and then we pick ten out of the kids who put in the hat, like something along those lines. I think there is some in between. Um, but I, I just wanted to say thank you to Patty for thinking about this stuff and. We can always try harder, um, but I think that Patty and the FOT board have just been doing an amazing job, and I'm very impressed having seen how much we struggled with it in the past. I'm really impressed with what you guys have been doing. Thanks, Kate. And by the way, we could use you again for this gala because that was your thing before. So this will be my first time without Kate. I don't know how I'm going to do it, so I might be calling you. I have all those, all those uh, tablecloths and like, <laughs> I'm like, like warm oven warmer things. I have all that stuff. So we can talk about it. <laughs> Is there any additional discussion regarding the fundraising proposal? Okay, there's a motion on the floor to approve the fundraiser for the gala and live auction. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Uh, Sarah and Sharice, I did not see a vote for the two of you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I'm looking at your picture, Sarah. You're up here twice. I looked at the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Patty. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the LSC candidate forum date. Um, as LSC, we are charged to determine the date um, where a LSC candidate forum can be held, which is an opportunity for candidates to um, address our school community. Um, I'm presuming this will be virtual, uh, and uh, I have not check to see how many candidates um, we have um, um, for LSC. Um, but the forum is to be March 21st through some date between March 21st and 25th. Um, looking at the calendar and just making suggestions based on our habits, um, that Wednesday would be the 23rd. Um, and that would be my initial initial suggestion, but this is a board decision. I'm just trying to give us a point to uh, start from. So um, any discussion on the matter or questions? Um, Nick, do you, or does anyone recall the format? Even though I participated, I can't remember the format. All right. It, um, I, it, I, I no, I do not, just because I know last election, I don't, was, I don't remember if there was one last, because I was smack in the middle of everything going on. Honestly, um, I can't remember either. We all spoke, like we, it was just everybody came and 
everyone had their like whatever three or four minutes or, or two to speak and everyone just spoke and then it ended it was very I believe it's three minutes um, yeah. everyone on there and it's not required to attend um, but if you chose you had I believe it's three minutes to give your statement mm -hmm. and then that was it there's not like a discussion there's no question and answer mm -hmm. it's just like a forum where you get to basically read what you put on your form or um, add something else to it but it's pretty simple and to the point. And I think the order of speaking was was randomly drawn, I believe. It's a random drawing. Um, and it does it, um, I think it, am I right that it goes in the order that we have for the um, voting ballots? I don't know that the, that will be determined by then. I, later? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think the mm -hmm. ballot order would be determined um, by then. Um, so um, is, there, is there any more discussion or anyone else um, would like to lean towards something besides Wednesday the 23rd? I'm fine with the 23rd. I guess what I propose would be Wednesday the 23rd, 6 p.m. At, at an hour that we're um, used to assembly. Um, unless we, unless since it is shorter, we want to move this to 6.30 to accommodate dinner. I don't know if, um, if, if, if anyone would be interested in that, but I'm, I'm fine with either way. I think since it's going to be shorter than an LSC meeting, maybe 630 would be better for people to get home and get on. And get kiddos fed and whatnot. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to put a motion out there. I, I move that the LSC uh, vote to hold the candidate forum on March 23rd virtually at 6.30. Is there a second? I second. It will be videotaped and available on the website afterward too, right? Sorry, recorded, not videotaped. Nobody has videotaped anymore. <laughs> Okay, uh, if there's no further discussion, there's a motion on the floor. All in, a, all in agreement, please vote using your icon. Okay, it looks like the motion carries unanimously. And so, um, Principal Gibson, I will work with you to get that information to where it needs to be with our um, election coordinator. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda, um, committee updates. Uh, first, just to refresh everyone's memory. Um, oh, are you, are you guys' uh, hands raised from voting? Okay. Okay, um, just to bring everyone up to speed regarding the bylaws um, back in December, um, there were the, the uh, input from legal, the bylaws with the input from legal, responses from legal were distributed, uh, but we needed more time to look at those. And so it was moved to January. And um, there, then in January, there was um, no update. I uh, can't remember why it was pushed to February. And so we didn't do them at the January meeting and we didn't have the February meeting. And so now, um, per uh, Sarah, who has been working so hard on these bylaws and going back and forth with legal. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, the bylaws are finalized and ready for vote. Um, my understanding is um, there have been no additional changes. There, there was that one um, sentence that had to be clarified, I think, by legal because it was just a fragmented sentence. And so um, we need to vote to approve the bylaws. We've already reviewed them. And so the, um, we're, we had to wait until we got feedback from legal to vote on them. So we're, we're not changing something that we haven't seen. We've already seen the bylaws as they uh, will be approved. Okay, is there a motion? Are we having any discussion about them? Uh, yeah, we will after after the motion. Okay. Is there a motion on the floor? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to approve um, the bylaws for Harry Tuppen. Now, let's see bylaws for Harry Tuppen. Is there a second? I second. 
Okay, discussion. I'd like to discuss the section on the committees. Specifically, um, it's not specific about the surveys. So I know that CPS holds the five essential surveys, but it says something about surveys and I wasn't quite clear of the purpose or how that data will be shared or how that data will be used and what type of survey from the committee meeting. Would you happen to have that, um, the bylaws pulled up Sarah by any chance? I do. And so um, the the um, information about the, the reference to the surveys, um, there is a sentence very close to that one. Um, you know, of course, you know, CPS uh, made comment about that and we were very mindful of about that as well. Um, surveys that are created um, are, are reviewed by the principal and also reviewed by uh, legal uh, so that the questions are um, are in, done in accordance and disseminated with the support of, of the school. Um, I can read that specific language um, that's there if you want me to, just let me know. But um, the surveys would be, um, that would, would, would of course be reflective of the work that the, the committee is, is working. Up, oh, we, we lost you, Sarah, we lost your we lost the, uh, where we could hear you. Okay. I believe she said the surveys. I, yeah, I, I think she, she was saying that the language is that the survey would be, um, agreed upon it has to be approved by by the principal and legal is that correct sarah okay <laughs> okay is there any additional discussion yes can it be written in that it says you know per the work that the committees are doing so it's specific that's what i believe i heard sarah say but i didn't see that written in so you mean is the, the purpose of the survey specific toward the work that the committees are doing? I see. I see. Um We choose to leave the committee open. Okay, I'm not I'm not sure what. Can you expound on that, Sarah? I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. Okay. So the, the language is there and left broad because LSC committees can change. And so any surveys, so I think Sarah, and not if this is correct interpretation, what you're saying is committees can change. And so the surveys would always be linked to the committee, but it's not stated specifically which committees. So I think what I'm asking, not that it's linked to like the equity committee or the inclusive committee, just saying that the surveys will be specific to the committee formed by the LSE. Because it just says surveys, it's like very broad. And in legal terms, that can mean a lot of different things. Okay. Um, I, I thought I heard someone. 
I, I was just going to say, I feel like if legal and the principal have to approve any of these committees, if that is the law, like the rule, I just feel like these rules, we have been going back and forth and like, we're, I feel like we might not even get these rules, the, the, these bylaws approved by the time the next LSC comes in and they start all over again. So I, I, I feel like for us to put them back again and redo them again, I, I would have to understand that there was a real risk of like, if, if it was like principal gets it, if, if someone could do a survey and find out all what all the parents think and not run it by you and not have it approved and all of that, that would be a big problem because then someone could come up and say, hey, this is some data from certain parents and, and it could um, just be used in a negative way. I completely get that. But if we are talking about that, the principal would have the ability is going to have to approve everything and with the uh, principal approving them i would assume that the principal would also be part of how are these going to be shared how are they going to be distributed all of that stuff um, i don't really see a risk for it to them being misused with its current statement so i i would like to hear what other board members have to have to say but i just feel like we're never going to get these approved Um, I'll add on to what Kate said. Um, I concur with what Kate is saying. Um, you know, one, we have been going back and forth with these. They have been reviewed multiple times by CBS Legal, by the LSC. I believe we're now, I think, about a year into this process of changing these bylaws. Um, as Kate said, they will be reviewed by the next um, LSC at their um, organizational meeting in July. Um, and there, I believe there are enough, um, whatever, layers or hopefully everyone knows what I mean, um, you know, enough checkpoints is what I'm looking for um, that I think, yeah, I don't believe, um, I don't see an issue with the way it is written right now. And, and just to clarify, we are talking about Article 8, Section 1 about the committees, right? I just want to make sure. Okay, good. I want to make sure we're all on the same part of the of the very long bylaws. <laughs> Thank you guys for your feedback. I was just asking for clarification as far as this because I didn't have a year to review this. So this was not brought to December and then at January meeting, we got it within tw less than 24 hours prior to our meeting. That's why I asked it to be tabled till February's meeting. But I just wanted clarification on that. I am okay with it since it does require approval of the principal as well as legal, I, I feel okay with it. Is there any additional discussion? Okay, there's a motion on the floor to approve the bylaws. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, um, it is the motion carries unanimously. Okay, the next item um, are we going to talk about committee activity and focus for the remainder of the school year. And um, just to kind of preface this discussion, I want to um, open it with um, what we're, what we're, what the intention is here. And so, uh, we are attempting to not only focus our committees, but also to streamline, um, the process of getting things done. Uh, it's been a challenging year with pandemic and, um, managing work stoppage and, and getting everything settled and, inheriting the CIWP and where work is to, to keep that moving, get things going. And so um, I'm hoping, well, I, I already know how this turns out because our committee members have been hard at work already um, focusing on items. And so um, we want to streamline the process so that we can uh, use our parent community who's, who's really ready to go and get some of these things done. And, um, also, just um, 
as we are hopeful to start getting parents back in the building. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to take advantage of that uh, soon as well. As, as Principal Gibson mentioned, there were a lot of people who signed up and went through the screening that um, in order to be able to do that. So we appreciate our parent community and definitely want to get those hands on for those who are willing to work. So with that said, um, Lori is the um, trifecta here. So um, let's see, you can, whichever one you wanna start with first, Lori, go ahead. All right, I'll just try to combine them. So you'll kind of develop, you've, if you've been listening to me when I talk a lot, um, you can kind of see where my focus has been lying when it comes to equity and inclusion and those things. So I serve, um, in addition to being a parent rep on your LSC, I'm on your communications committee, your Tubman Inclusive Education Supporters Committee, and your equity committee. And we're struggling with the same things that the CIWP is and everything is all of those things. How do we include a, like an umbrella? How does it cover everything? And so when you hear a lot of the questions I'm bringing up, those are coming up under all of those committees. And so one of the things that Tina has asked us to do was to really kind of focus now because we have so much we want to do and it's been so long since we've been able to do things so what can we really focus on and in my head sometimes it's what can we get wins what are things that we can really start to work with so we've come up with like two overarching projects and they just so happen that they they fit in with like all of these committees and one of them is already kind of went out of the gate really fast which is looking at library our library is such a way to support every department. It supports parents and kids and staff and teachers. And so we had a parent volunteer, uh, Cynthia Chernoff, her, our son is in fifth grade, and she came in really ready to go. She's actually a librarian by trade. Um, so she came in and immediately uh, met with the uh, Tubman Inclusive Education Supporters and the Equity Committee to talk about, let's look at our library as a whole, what is in our library? Is it the best materials? How are we representing the topics that we're learning about and our ideals and hopes? So do we have the right materials in our library? Are they accessible? Are we able to feature them um, in ways that tie in with what the IB ambassadors and student council are working on? And it's a huge project. So it also fits in that this could be something that could really bring in um, parent volunteers, especially when we can get parents in the building because Mr. Laughlin, who's very supportive of this, but he also has multiple hats in the school. He could use that support of really going through our materials. Also that went into what's in our classroom libraries because all the teachers have their own materials in libraries. And again, do they have what they need to represent? Um, do they have the best materials? Do we have a budget for the library? Which is why I brought that up earlier. What can we do to really do that? And library also goes in with when all the parents are coming in and talking about our reading scores and we're looking at our star 360 scores. And can we have library family reading nights? Like there's so many cool things that we can do. So library is gonna be one of our big projects that affects everybody and we can do really cool things. We're also talking about what can we do as parents and on these committees when we're talking about our safe spaces, our healing places, our restorative practices. Do our classrooms have peace corners? How are we implementing um, restorative conversations? And some, I'll be honest, when people talk, if you don't understand, there's so many, I don't understand all of it, but for example, what can we do? Um, I've had, my kids have had three separate restorative conversations this year um, with either staff members or each other, um, where someone, it's the, someone has been harmed, someone who did the harm, they can work it out together and build those really valuable emotional intelligence skills. There's so much that we can be doing. So where can we start? Because we're waiting for that position to be filled, which now I understand why I just can't magically have it right now. Um, what can we do in there? So one of the things we're talking about is space. How is our space being utilized in our school? Are there rooms that maybe we could turn into a sensory room, a calming classroom? What can we put into classrooms? Um, one of the things I asked for in my um, talks after the principal report, is there a budget for if we need special seating? Um, if you're new to the world of inclusive education, there's all sorts of different seats. There's wobble seats, there's seats that make you feel safe. Where can we work with all those? So those are kind of the overarching things like healing, safe spaces, restorative action, and the library are some of our big ones. Um, so for those of you who are interested in getting more involved, uh, the next one, Thursday, March 3rd, this Thursday at one o'clock, there's a communications meeting. 
Tuesday, March 8th at 6 p.m. is our next Tubman Inclusive Education Supporters. This is for allies, um, kids, uh, families of uh, supporters of children with IEPs, 504s, all of uh, those kind of things. Um, and that's gonna be Tuesday, March 8th at 6 p.m. And we actually have two special guests. Chicago Park District is, it's a virtual meeting. We'll be coming in to talk about inclusion in Chicago Park District, how to get an inclusion aid, what are the programs that are available. And it's perfect timing because two days before is when the Park District programs come out, the next book. And then we can learn about summer camps. Um, and I, there'll be a lot of really good information. And then Thursday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day at 6.30 is the next equity meeting. So there's a lot going on and there's a lot of ways for people to be involved and we really welcome any feedback and ways that we can bring in student voice and staff voice and all those kind of things. Thank you, Lori. Um, let's see, um, Sarah, I know your mic isn't, isn't working, but is there anything you'd like to add? <laughs> Um, while she's doing that, I'm, I'm just, hey, thank you, Lori. Oh, she captured oh. That thank you, Lori. Okay. Um, let's see. Tina, are we, sorry, are we able to ask a quick question? Um, oh, of course. and I know Lori, um, I think both ideas are wonderful. Obviously they do, um, have a lot of impact on the running of a school. Um, inside the school, you know, building and staff. Um, and I noticed from the last meeting where all the, the library and the spaces, which are both wonderful ideas, um, I noticed in the minutes there were no staff or admin present at that meeting. So I just want to know, were they invited and they just couldn't come? I know, especially like, but the library seems a huge thing. Uh, and it seems strange to me that Mr. Laughlin was not part of the Mr. Laughlin had his own meetings uh, with Cynthia. So he has been meeting with her and I know they've been looping in Ms. Gibson, I believe. Um, and there's so a- I, Yeah, and I actually met um, Cynthia yesterday. Um, uh, she was in the library, it was great to, to meet She's her. She's very excited. So um, yes, Mr. Laughlin has been looped in, like we talked about it, but he is definitely 100% being looped in and his opinion and what he needs is totally being taken into account. And, right. and all the committees, a lot of times it's like when we're, some of these are scheduled during staff hours. Um, I would always welcome staff that wants to be involved. Um, just like, sometimes I'm like, I wish I could crash some of your important meetings because I have lots to say, uh, but you're always welcome to have that voice included. Or you can meet with me if you can't take those meetings. If there's a staff member that's really interested or has concerns or questions, I'm always willing to either come in in person and meet during off times or meet virtually. Yeah, and and thank you, Laurie. And I understand, you. I know he's been looped in because I've been talking to him too with budget for books and things like that. Um, just maybe just like best practice in the future to loop the staff member in before all these ideas because obviously we would know what is feasible and not. Um, so just in the future to make sure to loop in the staff from the get-go, thank you. Thank you, Nick, and thanks, Lori. Uh, Principal Gibson. Thank you. I was just going to say, um, just to let Lori know, I, I totally side with Mr. Hall. Just don't forget um, about the staff. And Mr. Hall is one of the members of our budget committee. So he has, you know, copies of the budget. He's very well informed. So I suggest sometimes, I like just trying to reach out to other members on the other committees if they and are also on the council and just to let you know nick cynthia introduced herself the moment she came into administration first before she even went up and started and then Lori, you brought up two questions and i want to make sure i address them first thank you all thank all the committee members i think these are really good areas to target uh we do have funds as far as the uh, library so funds can be allocated um to make improvements there, but include the staff voices. That would be my only uh, feedback there. And then just loop back in with administration as uh, Nick shared. The other thing for special education, and you brought up specific materials and sensory rooms and space and in chairs. There's a lot of moving parts there as far as space here. We just don't have extra rooms here at Tubman. Spacing is a concern. We don't even have a cafeteria. The good news is 
CPS has actually just put some money in a special education fund. I didn't share it here yet because I'm going to share it in our PPC and I want to share it with our special education teachers and for them to share how what's the needs and, and we'll try to address that first and um, use that money to buy like the special seating, wobbly chairs, sensory items that our students need. And we will also look at other money in our internal accounts to go toward that area to support the committee work. So thank you. It does take a village to raise your child. I, it's so exciting because it's so many times I have three IEPs and sometimes there's things I'm like, oh, we need the sensory headphones. And I'm realizing some of the really cool stuff that teachers are providing that my kids are so excited about. I'm realizing that they're paying for it out of their pocket or things like that. So it's really exciting that I hope that they can start to, to come to you all and we can really build upon they ha we have such great staff and teachers on there that we can get those little things that make such a difference. Thanks so much, uh, Lori. I'm off camera because I'm about to plug in my computer before I lose you guys. Um, just also wanted to report out that um, you will begin seeing lots more activity uh, on the uh, Tubman social media pages. Um, we're going to begin rolling that out and uh, Lori and Patty um, are on board with that project and we are looking for anyone else to join. We would love to have um, teacher representation as well. Um, of course, with meetings, we have to be cognizant of um, OMA, but um, we would love to have um, everyone's input and um, those the way that committee will work or the way those communications will work, of course, is to get um, administration approval before anything is posted um, so that we maintain consistency with our school's messaging. We have a lot of parents, to, um, myself included, who have PR and marketing backgrounds. So we're all ready with that. What is your vision? What is your voice? And we'll happily work with getting that out there. Especially because we are seeing so much cool stuff. And I watch other schools who are not half as cool as us. And they're all over social media. And I'm like, we are so much cooler. And I want them to know how cool we are. And, you know, and also since um, we are now ramping up the um, committee activity and, and, and focusing, honing in on things for the second half of the school year, um, there are also, speaking of communication, will be regular um, LSC communication to make sure everyone is aware of dates and in meetings and ways to get involved. Any, let's see. I hope you can hear me. Yes. All right, just, I just also posted in the chat. I just wanted to reiterate what was shared. Um, and just to point out, we do um, uh, share the uh, committee meeting announcements and minutes um, to the entire board, which is reflective of um, families, admin, and and staff at our, our wonderful school. And I just wanted to echo Lori and Principal Gibson's point that truly it does take a village and we're all really flexible uh, and being able to lean in and, and, and have openness and working together. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, um, are, there, is there, are there any other comments? or questions? I just want to throw out too, like, because we do have a lot of staff on here too, like, even though that we're parent reps, we're also here, if there's things that staff feels like that our committees that they could really add to it, we would welcome that voice. And the same thing with parents, if you're hearing this, and you're maybe you're even thinking, I don't have time to serve on a committee, but I have some great ideas, or I can't come to the meeting, but I could do this, please reach out. There's, there's ways for everybody to help. And we all have like some of us I'm a stay-at-home mom. I have more time to be able to do all of these things, and it makes me feel good. I'll be honest. Someone asked, why do I do so much? Because so much of the world and is out of our control, but the more you, you find ways to help, you can feel that you're actually having an effect on things. But not everybody has that time, or not everybody has that personality. So whichever way, if you want to be involved, reach out, and we can find something for you to do. Um, but everybody is welcome, and everybody has a voice. And we really appreciate the attendance at these meetings, which goes really long and the committee meetings. And so it's a really great community. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, that brings us to um, old business, which is the public participation piece. Uh, Nick, do we have anyone sign up? 
We do. We have three um, public participants tonight, and I believe okay. they are still all here. Thank you for being patient. Um, so I'll go ahead and read the, um, the little disclaimer at the beginning. Members of the public are welcome to make comments and ask questions, but must sign in to participate. The public is called upon to speak in the order they sign in. The public is kindly requested to limit their comments and questions to three minutes based on the comments or questions. The principal may address some concerns directly, and if necessary, create an action step for the LSE to follow up with the involved parties at a future date. While the LSE will do its best to address any comments or questions, when necessary, more time may be needed to adequately address a particular concern. Um, our first um, public participant is Laura Franz. Laura? Hi, guys. Okay. Uh, just let me pull up my... Thanks for the meeting, as usual. Appreciate everybody's time and hard effort to make Tubman um, the school that it is. So um, thanks for having me. Congrats on the CPS board meeting, Ms. Gibson. I watched the recording. Everyone sounded fantastic and you represented our school so well. Uh, it was a proud moment. Um, I'd like to start by mentioning that unfortunately we did miss the February LSC meeting. So we missed celebrating Black History Month. And I'd like, I just wanted to recognize two great leaders in the area of literacy. Uh, Frederick Douglass was a formerly enslaved man who became a prominent activist, author, and public speaker, he became a leader in the abolitionist movement which sought to end the practice of slavery before and during the Civil War. In the antebellum era, laws were established forbidding slaves to learn to read and write and making it illegal for others to teach them. I think that's really demonstrates just how powerful uh, literacy is um, and how scared people were um, if people uh, were able to access it. Um, Douglas' passion for education led him to create a Sabbath school for his fellow slaves. And one of his most famous quotes is, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Um, I've also spoken about this woman before, but wanted to recognize her again, Chicago's own Marva Collins. 1975, Marva Collins took $5,000 of her own money and started West Side Prep. She took in children that had been cast aside and denied education at other schools and gave them another chance to succeed. She used a rigorous and demanding curriculum and taught kids how to read using explicit and systematic methods. Um, so that's February, but on to, on to March. Um, it's designated as National Reading Month. Um, so I hope everyone takes a minute to reflect on the importance of reading and literacy in our everyday lives and how important reading is to living a successful and fulfilling life. Um, now I'd like to, I know there's a lot going on with the school, you know, like math, and obviously I'm not aware of all the things that go on behind the scenes. So I'm just here to continue to advocate for a change in tier one reading instruction. Um, I feel like I'm trying to stay fairly positive about this subject and I'm super appreciative of men being open to listening. I know teachers are pulled in a hundred million different directions um, and I'm aware that change takes time. But with all that being said, I just need to say that I truly believe that if we continue to use a program that utilizes and promotes three queuing and instruction, we are best doing a disservice to our students and at worst doing harm to our most vulnerable children. There are under unintended consequences to inactivity and having to delay a change to another whole year because next year and then the year after that is just um, really, any, uh, it's just a lot. Um, just wondering if there's a plan to supplement grades one and two while we continue to use it. I know K is being supplemented, which is fantastic. Um, like I said before, the creators admit it, it's not for struggling readers and dyslexic students and organizations such as Ed Reports, which is an independent nonprofit designed to improve K-12 education has given it a failing grade. Um, in also in recent literacy news, the Ontario Human Rights Commission completed their right to read investigation. And based on the outcome of that report, Ontario will be ending their use of the three queuing system. Um, you know, in the meantime, I think uh, things that we can attain to help uh, getting the universal screener happening in K through two that looks to identify kids that are struggling to gain those skills and the earlier intervention, the better the outcome. Also, our DL teachers, um, can they have training in interventions like the Wilson Reading System, which is a tier three intervention? I don't believe the school uh, has a current tier three intervention along with the appropriate teacher training. Um, I know CPS is providing and paying for that training at, at different points throughout the year, and um, have we been able to sign anyone up? Um, and as the committee looks at social, emotional, and equity issues, I ask that you look at how those things are affected by both literacy and illiteracy, because they have major impacts on um, both of those issues. Uh, it's not just about an equal right to read, it's about an equal right to a future. Um, I know you guys take all this very seriously and um, I appreciate that. I just 
really just going to continue, I guess, showing up and, and advocating. But I do appreciate everything um, that you guys are all doing um, with all that being said. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Laura. Our next public participant is Dana Carmen. Hi. Um, it's nice to see all you guys because I feel like I haven't seen everybody in so long. Um, I have a couple like questions and my first one was um, I was wondering with what's left of the school year if we might be able to like pull out some normalcy. Um, I feel like people are feeling a little more comfortable with things and there might already be some stuff like in the queue and and on the list but um, specifically, like, I know we've mentioned parent volunteers a couple times tonight and some FOT feedback, um, that we got at our last meeting was that like parents would love to volunteer. Some had signed up and they're not aware to your point, Lori, recommittees. Um, honestly, until I just looked at the website, I never even knew they were listed on the website, um, as meetings. So I think a lot of parents don't even know that there are committees that they could potentially, uh, be involved in. So I think a little more communication around that would be great because, um, you know, I think we're hearing from some of the younger families in particular who ha aren't as familiar with the school that like they haven't even been inside and they don't even like know where their kids classroom are. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, maybe like field trips would be opportunities for parents to volunteer or if we could get like an assembly or two back in the works. Um, I know it's probably a little late timing wise, but I was kind of wondering why the school musical couldn't happen this year. I know other schools were able to do them. And so it would just be really great to have some of that if we could get in the year before it finishes out. <laughs> um, and then just tagging on to Laura as usual, um, you know, the star report data is pretty concerning. Um, in addition to no growth in at least one grade, there were a couple grades that dropped in ELA. Um, and just, you know, as Laura said, like having interventions that are appropriate for kids, also making sure that we're not just looking at star 360 data as our only data point for growth. You know, a lot of kids with troubles decoding and phonics issues don't necessarily present exactly the same. You know, my kid presents really classically, but there are a lot of kids and adults, statistics bear it out, that um, make it well into adulthood um, being good students who, you know, had a ton of trouble reading. And it's really important that those foundational skills um, are met. They're met at the level that they're at. Um, foundationally, not just, hey, this kid gets straight A's and so they, you know, they're doing great. Um, and so, you know, Laura mentioned Wilson. I know that CPS is doing um, some, has some offerings like through Skyline with Amplify, like even if that's an option, just, you know, like she said, like, um, you know, that tier one curriculum, I know there's so much going on with math and all that other stuff, but um, I didn't see that on the CIWP uh, as one of the curriculum points. So um, just wanted to make sure we're still looking at that um, as immediate as possible. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dana. And our uh, final public participant, Karen Bassi. Hello. Uh, I am just so thrilled to see so many of you here. And I have uh, a friend here as well, our fourth grade Noah fourth grader Noah. Um, I just wanted to really shout out all of our staff and administrators who have weathered this storm of COVID, of continuing challenges. Um, it's like every day there's something new that's thrown at us and your grace and empathy during these moments for our students is profound. And I want you to also feel that same sort of empathy and grace from all of us as parents and guardians um, so that you see that we see you uh, because I know it's not easy. Uh, my husband's a Chicago public school teacher as well. And um, we see very much uh, the daily challenges that they face and how they're also trying to help their students through real trauma or real everyday life, right? Which may or may not include trauma. Um, I also want to say, and I've shared this with Principal Gibson, um, 
you know, the, the symbolism of our sign, uh, our sign change on the biggest snowstorm of the year, that that sign was going up as people were just struggling to even get through city streets. The fact that that shows that the time is always right to do what's right. You can't put it on the back burner. You can't say, oh, maybe we'll get to it in the spring. It was, that was the day that they did it. And it was a powerful symbol for uh, our story and our journey because it's hard. It was a very hard process. It will continue to be hard and it's still the right thing to do. So thank you to all of you. Um, and finally, I will say seeing our students speak their hearts out at the assembly, seeing our students speak last week to the Board of Education, holy cow, that was remarkable. And hearing you, Principal Gibson, speak um, I, I will say, I think that's so formative for our students, but also it shows them their power of their voice and all that is possible here. And I hope we continue with that energy. Uh, finally, I, I do want to lift up some of the additional ideas of potentially bringing in parents um, in even within the surrounding area of the school, right on the on the playground or in other spaces at drop off as a way to say, come on in. We do want you to socialize. It doesn't have to be like a um, if I mean, we walk to school, but it doesn't have to be like a kiss and go high five and leave. You can actually talk to other other families. And I, I did a walk this week with a, a parent who I love and adore who I haven't seen in forever. And it was like a shot in the arm of like, we are a community. We have connection and we are here for one another in a way that as we come out of this next, this challenging phase of the pandemic and hopefully move into new spaces, maybe it can be a model for us going forward. So thank you. Uh, three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, that concludes our public participation for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Hall. And thanks to everyone who signed up and participated. And thanks for your patience. We really appreciate your staying engaged for sure. Uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, action items and next steps. Um, in Cindy's absence tonight, I've been jotting things down. And so- Tina, um, am I able to give a response? I oh, like I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh, yes. Okay, I, did, I just didn't wanna, first of all, I would just like to thank our public participants. Thank you, Laura, Dana, Karen, for your kind words of encouragement, your questions, uh, celebrating and bringing information about Black History Month. We truly appreciate it because we are a uh, IB school, we are teaching intercultural awareness. Uh, to address the Wilson training and the CIWP, there's a couple of things. We didn't create the CIWP, so those priorities are already there. We're not allowed to um, change them. So the focus will be math. That's according to the CIWP, but it doesn't mean we're not working on literacy. It's just really hard to adapt and change two curriculums at one time. That's overkill for our teachers, our staff, and our students to change that much in one year. Now, I would like to give you an update. Uh, I, I sent an email to meet with you all, and we weren't able to meet in February. Uh, just as a literacy and parent focus group, I reached out to the district to get additional Wilson training. So some of our teachers have already engaged in Wilson training. So on February 16th, not only did I speak to our district rep, but so did Ms. Rebecca Rosenberg, recommending uh, several of our diverse learner teachers to take the Wilson training. In addition, addition to that Wilson training, there's a Wilson part called Just Words. And so far, the district is not offering training for that, but I did get the Wilson information so we could pay for our teachers to be trained through our professional development funds. So that is something ongoing. I invite you guys to come and have a more intimate conversation with me during principal conversation this Friday, and I will share more details out. Thank you all again. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Principal Gibson. I'm so sorry for the oversight. Uh, let's see, Lori. I just wanted to say again, thank you. I love it when you all bring ideas. I get super excited. Um, so I'm never tired if you never think that, oh, it's me again. No, it's awesome. You saw my face. I was like, yeah. 
Um, so Laura, I wanted to say I took it to heart what you were saying. And I like the idea of when we're talking about looking at classroom libraries and what we're raising up during the books that I like the idea of having a Chicago tie to all these themes too. So while we're doing international and national ties, having a Chicago's own, I think that would be really valuable. I think you'd be a really great person to have on the library committee, by the way. Um, Dana, what you said, yes, about it's so hard to get all that information out because there's so many different ways. So I'm gonna put it on the agenda for the communications meeting on Thursday that we put together a room parent email with all the opportunities that are coming up and what we're hoping will be coming up and some information. I'll talk to Principal Gibson about what are the newest policies on getting volunteers approved so we can get that information out. Um, so I just wanna let you know. And Karen, what you said about going for a walk, I actually picked up my kids the other day, met a mom and we've met twice. And yesterday we went for a 90, walk, 90 minute walk down by the lake. Mm -hmm. And it was so great to get to know her and talk about things in that other setting. So I was like, maybe one day I'll just put it out there that, hey, let's all meet at Montrose Harbor and we can have coffee and walk um, and start to think about different ways that we can support each other as families and caregivers too. So there's lots of ways that we can take this outside of just what do we have to fix right now? What are we doing to support each other? And that's also a healing and restorative space. Thank you, Lori. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? Okay, thank you. Um, the next item is action items and next steps. And so um, what I have is, um, well, Lori, you just uh, gave two for yourself. So I, I wrote those down <laughs> for uh, the parent, the room parent email and um, connecting with uh, Principal Gibson as far as um, volunteers, what we need to do there and what I believe there are CPS stipulations um, that we have to be cognizant of. And so um, un unfortunately that decision is not just made at the building level. And so we'll have to be sure and, and um, follow those guidelines as well. Um, also, um, Principal Gibson and I will get the, um, the forum, the candidate forum date submitted and announced and organized um, accordingly. And then also um, I'll be putting together an LSC communication to occur regularly um, to keep our student, uh, to keep our family community updated on all of the committee work and other things. Um, is there anything else anyone can think of? Um, I know, Tina, I, it's not like an action item, it's something to keep in mind. I know you and I have been talking about this already is just for the whole council to start thinking about um, principal evaluation, because even though I don't believe it's until May, um, as we know, if we want to, you know, reach out and get feedback, um, that does take a while. Um, and so just, I, I do think we owe it to Principal Gibson as it is her first year here at Tubman to give her as thorough of an evaluation as we can and really give her um, uh, constructive feedback. Um, so just putting that out there, because I know it kind of sneaks up on us every year. So. Right. And so, um, as I mentioned to you, Nick, there will be a special meeting for that. So I'll be following up with the council on that. Great. Thank you, Tina. Oh, no problem. Um, let's see. The next item on the agenda is the next meeting date, which will be our uh, right now. It's our regular meeting, which is April 6, 2022. Um, will be virtual unless uh, otherwise noted. The next item on the agenda is to adjourn. Is there a motion? I'll motion to adjourn. Is there a second? A second. Okay, any discussion? I doubt it. All in favor of adjourning, please use your icon to vote. The motion to adjourn carries unanimously. Uh, this meeting is adjourned at 8, 12 p.m. Thanks everyone so much for your engagement and your patience. Take care.